yes, my name is Gwendolyn Pepper. I recently completed my MA in Medieval Archaeology at the University of York, and I'm currently an employee of the Anglo-Saxon Laboratory based in New York. So today I'm going to discuss uh, time and craft production with a specific focus on time in relation to medieval textile production in England. So the following is based on observations from my MA dissertation which uh, used experimental archaeology to compare the length of time it takes to weave basically cloth of exactly the same dimensions on two different types of loom. So, uh, what I want to get at really is why it's important to consider time in relation to textile production and also to explore ways of visually interpreting manufactured time. So I will do that by first giving a sort of whirlwind tour of uh, this is the historical context of medieval weaving, um, and then discuss the possibility of visualizing manufactured time uh, in the medieval period uh, based on some of the results from this experiment, and then get into the question of can an object be a visual representation of its own manufactured time. So to start with, um, during the early Middle Ages, um, there's a real emphasis on craft production in sort of rural centers being a collective activity that is primarily controlled by women. The type of loom that was in use is the warp weighted loom, pictured here. And this was in use probably up until the 10th century. It's simple in construction and is understood to be fairly slow to use. Um, as you get the sort of increased uh, urbanization of settlements, you start to see shifts in how textile production is, is organized. There is a the brief introduction of a new type of loom. This is the two-beam vertical loom. This loom didn't necessarily have an impact on production time, so it wasn't incorporated into this experiment. However, around the year 1000, you see the introduction of this new type of loom, the horizontal treadle loom, pictured here. Um, this loom is understood to be faster to weave with, and it's typically associated with the formation of weaving guilds around this time, with men taking over textile production, and with sort of increased commercial production. And the you know very sort of rigid link of speed connected with all these changes is <coughs> fairly typical of what Pfaffenberger terms as the uh, standard view of technology. So this idea that there's a sort of inevitable linear production, pr <laughs> excuse me, um, inevitable linear uh, progress of technology without as much of a sort of focus on the, the social context of the people who are using these tools. Um, and it should be noted that there are no concrete figures on how much faster this type of loom is than its predecessors. And this was really what motivated this experiment, because I wanted to develop a methodology for comparing loom speeds um, so that we can sort of make observations of every stage of textile production and what's going on um, in terms of these changes. And um, this is hopefully sort of in keeping with uh, science and technology studies, sort of people-driven view of technological development. So that kind of brings me to visualizing time spent in manufacture. Um, this is just a diagram of a very basic cloth structure. The warp are the vertical threads which are mounted onto the loom prior to weaving. The weft is the thread that moves in between them. A friend of mine said you can sort of keep that in your head by thinking that the weft moves weft to right. Um, <laughs> this is some of the terminology I'll be using in the discussion. So this is a table of the results from my experiment. So as I said, the cloth uh, woven on the two different types of looms was the same dimension, the same weaver used both looms. So I tried to eliminate as many variables as possible. Um, this a line in blue was I'm going to get back to it, but it wasn't incorporated into the final figures of my comparison. Uh, so I think the first sort of important thing to note is that uh, the warp weighted loom did indeed take a longer time to produce the cloth than the horizontal treadle loom, as expected. Um, and the horizontal treadle loom at the weaving stage could produce cloth between five to seven times faster than the warp weighted loom, depending on how you calculated these differences. And um, I guess the interesting thing that came out of this that's kind of contrary to this assumption of efficiency is that the horizontal treadle loom wasn't more efficient in every aspect of production. So the setup time for the two types of looms was pretty much identical at about 15 hours. And the horizontal treadle loom actually took about twice as long to thread in that process compared to the warp weighted loom. Um, 
So you get uh, cases where it is certainly not more efficient uh, when we're talking about production. If you kind of convert the percentage of time spent on the different stages of setup, um, as I've done in these pie charts, um, you can sort of see these differences more clearly. So the purple pie segment is the uh, time spent weaving. And uh, you can see it takes up the majority of time um, in the top chart. That's for the warp witted loom, which is the uh, earlier loom used in uh, the Anglo-Saxon period. Whereas it's the sort of in the minority of time spent on the later loom. And I think it's really important to consider how that would have affected a weaver's relationship with these processes. If you are an Anglo-Saxon weaver working at the warp weighted loom, the setup is sort of a preamble to the, the main task, which is the weaving. And that's going to be a fairly satisfying task in comparison to every other stage. If you are weaving in the later Middle Ages on this new type of loom, weaving almost becomes an afterthought in terms of all of the work that goes into it. And I think that's a really interesting thing to keep in mind because I suspect that there would be an extra motivation to try to come up with ways to make these preceding stages more efficient. Because if you can weave this much faster and produce more cloth, um, that's what you want to be focusing on. Spending all this time threading is uh, kind of an annoying extra bit. So that's kind of one way of, of looking at uh, the time that goes into uh, these stages of production. So just sort of moving in a broad sense, um, thinking about how the hours that go into producing cloth uh, within the span of a year. These are some recent attempts I've made at sort of visualizing this. So the uh, image on the left is based on some suggestions by Penelope Walton Rogers on how labor uh, re specifically related to textile production might have been distributed throughout the year. So she suggests that weaving, indicated by the dark red spots, was happening mostly in the summer months, beginning in spring, because you're going to have more daylight at that time. Um, you've also got agricultural activities relating to shearing sheep, harvesting flax, that sort of thing, which are going to be relevant at that time of year. Activities <coughs> like spinning yarn can take place throughout the entire year, and you would probably actually have some catch-up time in the winter months where there are not as many agricultural activities taking up your time. So. What's suggested by this is that you have this, this concentration of long weaving days at a sort of optimal time for uh, long hours of daylight. Um, once you get to the later Middle Ages, uh, you've got sort of craft specialization. So a weaver is a weaver throughout the year. Um, this is their profession. And so their working hours are likely to be affected seasonally, but it's going to be daylight as a primary consideration. And this is reflected in uh, records which uh, specifically ban weaving by candlelight. So there is a reliance on natural light, and that is going to affect uh, your working days. Uh, so this, these are just kind of some ways to think about how uh, time goes into these stages of production. So I'm going to just move quickly on to whether or not an object itself can be a room visual representation of its own manufacture time. Uh, returning briefly to my previous chart, uh, this line in blue. So this is the time that goes into basically preparing the weft, winding out on a dowel, or preparing it some other way to be used in weaving. This is a crucial task to production, but it's the sort of thing that could potentially be handed off to an apprentice in the later Middle Ages, and there are other ways to kind of minimize the time it takes in the Anglo-Saxon period, and that's why it wasn't factored in. Um, and the reason this is important is because I think that this represents what I would call invisible time in craft production. So it doesn't matter if you take four minutes or 20 minutes to prepare that weft, that is not going to have a visual impact on the cloth. You cannot interpret how long someone took to do that at, at specific stages like that. Um, what I, so it's just the sort of thing where you, it's not really possible to interpret it just by looking at an object that's worth bearing in mind. Something I'm interested in is the specific visual cues. So these are images from uh, the results of my experiment. These are, uh, this is from the uh, piece of cloth which was woven on the warp weighted loom. The image on the left was from the beginning of weaving, the image on the right was from the end of weaving. 
The key difference is that at the end of weaving, uh, the work was a bit more careless, I would say. And uh, you can see that by the spacing of the threads. The weft threads are much farther apart. And of course, the impact of that was that it took less time to weave more cloth at the end of this process. So I've got, you know, the rates here, the, the cloth on the left took a, an hour to weave three and a half centimeters, whereas eight and a half centimeters could be woven in an hour by the end. So if you understand the, the type of equipment that is being used, um, it is, I think, at least possible to um, make some connections in terms of whether an object took a bit longer to take, and how much care might have been put into it, and, and it's a little bit of a visual cue there. This is why it's also really important to understand the technology being used, though. So, um, the image on the left is once again from the horizontal treadle loom. It's the uh, rate of eight and a half centimeters per hour. The image on the right was woven on the horizontal treadle loom. You can see the threads are much more closely and evenly spaced. Um, so if we were just going by this previous metric, you would say that it probably took more time than the warp rated loom. However, because it was used on a, woven on a more efficient loom, 30 centimeters could be woven in an hour compared to eight and a half. So that's a significant difference in, in how quickly this cloth could be produced and just kind of emphasizes the importance of understanding that context. So the final um, thing that I think is really interesting to consider in terms of trying to read time in an object are visible errors. And this is um, really clear in examples of archeological textiles. So this is another photo of uh, the horizontal treadle loom cloth. You can see that vertical stripe there. Those are three threads that are lying next to each other when they shouldn't be, they should be alternating. And uh, to kind of illustrate how much uh, or what this represents, this is basically time saved by not going back and correcting that error. So if we sort of round out the hours it took me to thread this loom to 10 hours and say that that error occurred exactly halfway through, um, but I didn't notice the error until the beginning of weaving, we're looking at undoing five hours of threading, fixing the error and redoing it. I mean, you, at a minimum, you've got 10 hours of time lost, potentially longer, depending on how much was woven and that sort of thing. And uh, I think that's a, a really interesting thing to consider when we look at historical examples. So these are some diagrams of cloth fragments found um, if from the uh, Anglo-Saxon period in England. The top one is from London, the bottom one is from Coppergate. And uh, these are, you know, basically what you're seeing uh, in the bottom especially is that this is a a twill pattern, so the, the diagonal lines are intentional and there are some jumps there that are not. Um, so the fact that that remained uh, in the final woven cloth is an indicator that the person weaving this did not take the time to go back and correct that. And they probably had good reason not to because they would have lost a lot of time. We also get sort of the reverse, which is uh, examples of extra time taken to uh, potentially improve the appearance of an object. So. The image on the left there is an example of the loose weft threads being darned back into the cloth. So that's extra time being taken to uh, make sure that you don't have these dangling ends and other issues like that. Um, the image on the right is what's called a weft gore. So what's happening in that cloth is that um, it's becoming progressively more uneven and an extra bit of weft has to be woven in, not necessarily right to the end, to, to make the cloth even again. So that's something that doesn't have to be done but um, a conscious decision is clearly being made in order to improve the appearance and potentially the texture of the cloth. So I find this example, um, it's a wool shirt from uh, Robert in Sutherland to be really interesting because to me this represents uh, what as, as a weaver I would interpret this as someone who probably didn't take time at the start of production and paid for it later. So we have some, some examples of what you could term as careless mistakes, the, the long vertical lines in the line drawing are um, threading errors, so uh, threads lying next to each other that shouldn't be. You've also got some, uh, in the text it, uh, Henschel mentions that there are uh, knotted warp threads, so very sloppy uh, corrections being made when things are breaking. Um, and the other thing that you're seeing are some, some weaving errors where the weft is again skipping over warp threads it shouldn't. But what you also see, sort of denoted by those, those little um, uh, 
chevrons um, throughout are a lot of weft gores. So to me, that suggests that there was a tension error, pot potentially from a careless or speedy setup, which is needing to be corrected in a very slow and time-consuming way throughout the weaving of the cloth. Um, it should be noted this uh, shirt is tentatively dated to the late medieval period, but has also been described as very primitive. So I think it's sort of anyone's guess as to exactly what type of loom was being used for that. I, 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 I can't say for sure, and I think that's another a bit of context that would be important in, in assessing what's going on. Um, but I think it can give a little bit of insight in, potentially into the priorities of the weaver in question in this piece. And I think it raises some interesting questions in terms of thinking about what's motivating people um, <coughs> as they're carrying uh, cloth production. I guess what I'd like to just leave you with is that I, I do believe that manufacturing time can have a visual impact on the piece of cloth being produced. And I think that experimental archaeology can play a key role in under, having a deeper understanding of the time that goes into manufacturing objects. And I think comparative experiments are particularly useful. Um, and finally, just that you know, seeing the time that goes into producing an object can allow for a more nuanced understanding of the context in which that object is produced and, and hopefully provide a bit more of a personal connection with the people who are making these objects. Uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>